Um, thank you for coming out um, on a really hot day at the end of the conference. <laughs> um, <clears throat> several months ago, a team of researchers looked at the brain activity of people reading fiction, and what they found, according to the New York Times, was that the brain, quote, does not make much of a distinction between reading about an experience and encountering it in real life. In each case, the same neurological regions are stimulated. When participants read the sentence, Pablo kicked the ball, for example, brain scans showed activity in the motor cortex, localized, in fact, to the specific region that coordinates leg movement. Previous studies have shown that merely reading the words perfume or coffee activate the olfactory cortex. This got me thinking about my own reading experience, and I tried to think back to the novels that I recalled as lived experiences. And what immediately sprung to mind were not the opening lines or final paragraphs or beautiful metaphors of these books, but the scenes. Certain intense moments within those stories had made very deep impressions on me, and I wanted to know why those scenes and not others. So I'd like to talk a bit today about the scene, what it is, and what makes a good one. Jerome Stern, in his book, Making Shapely Fiction, describes the scene as something that creates a memorable moment, interrupts normal patterns, where the reader is made to feel the drama of the moment, just like a child making a scene. Madison Smart Bell describes the craft that goes into a scene as, quote, making the reader feel as if he is present for the action or watching it in a theater or film. The scene allows you to highlight certain moments and turning points within a story. For the purposes of this talk, I'll define scene as an exchange of dialogue between two or more characters in which one or both of them are changed. It is, as I said, a turning point. And it's precisely the fact that a scene must accomplish something narratively that makes it so tricky to write one. You're juggling plot, character, pacing, dialogue, description, and yet it must not seem written, but lived. So I'd like to examine what I think are some of the key components of the scene. Setting, props, gestures, the unspoken, intent and accident, time, and narrative purpose. This list is not meant to be used as a checklist while writing. It would be completely paralyzing. <clears throat> the primary quality of a scene is its aliveness, so I'd encourage you to write at first in a really uninhibited way that allows you to discover what is happening in the moment that you write. These elements might be useful, though, to think about when you go back and revise work. And they can certainly be used um, as something to pay attention to while reading published work. So let's begin with setting. We often describe setting in terms of the novel or the story, but not in terms of the scene itself. To me, setting has become such an important component of the scene that I no longer begin to write a scene until I know exactly where it takes place. And when I'm stuck with a scene, I will often change its setting to see what that reveals. Because when I look closely at the fictional scenes I most admire, they are strongly dictated by their sense of place. For example, the first question you might ask yourself, is the setting of your scene intimate or public? A breakup will play out very differently in a bedroom as opposed to a restaurant, as would a scene of seduction. Are the characters aware of being watched? Afraid of being interrupted? Afraid of being trapped? Is this space controlled by one of the characters? And if so, how does that shift the power dynamic? <clears throat> Once you've decided on your setting, it's important to visualize the entire space. That doesn't mean you need to detail every corner of the room or every crease in the curtains. And there's certainly a wonderful history in the novel of elaborate descriptions of space, and it's my personal belief that this was before, um, certainly not just the internet and television, but even before photography was widespread, and people would not have actually known what a room in another country might have looked like. <clears throat> but you do want to imagine the setting deeply enough so that you can see your characters clearly moving through it. I always keep white paper by my desk and will force myself to draw a scene if I think I'm not quite seeing it clearly. The advantage of this full imagining of the space is that it brings us to the second element of the scene, props. Your setting should ideally present your characters with some objects or props that they can interact with in a way that is particular to their narrative. Jennifer Egan's wonderful story, Found Objects, tells the story of a kleptomaniac who invites an internet date back to her apartment. She's surrounded by all of the items she has stolen. Each one reveals a piece of her past, and her date eventually picks one up, bath salts, and asks if he can use them. 
In Egan's story, A Visit, a character arrives at the office of an old friend with a fish in a bag. Egan's settings are actually quite simple, bars, bedrooms, offices, but her props are extraordinary, and they lend her stories that feeling of being lived. Another great story prop that springs to mind, um, Ethan Kane's story, The Accountant, in which um, Willie Mays' leggings are stolen. <clears throat> On to element number three. A friend called me a few years ago in the final stages of finishing a novel 700 pages long and asked me, please give me some gestures. <clears throat> I'm out of gestures. Um, this is one of those, you know, dirty little things writers probably don't want to make public. Um, <laughs> But when you're writing something several hundred pages long, you run out of certain things. Um, because most scenes involve exchanges of dialogue and because most people do not speak without pausing and fidgeting and fumbling, scenes require that your characters physically embody the space and move within that space so that the scene feels alive. Motion helps bring the text to life. It lights up that motor region of our brains. <clears throat> And seeds need this to feel in motion. The problem is it is extremely hard to come up with enough gestures to fill your scenes. And we all know the usual recycled gestures. He took a sip of his coffee. She took a drag of her cigarette. Um, can only be used so many times. <clears throat> in life, of course, people take plenty of sips and clear their throats and smoke cigarettes. Only we pay little attention to these actions because they're so commonplace. To describe a gesture on the page draws attention to it. It suggests meaning, and so you want to make sure it feels worthy of your reader's attention. From my own experience, as I struggle to finish my third novel, I've come to the conclusion that I can't find an appropriate gesture to pace a scene until I actually have fully discovered the setting and props. <clears throat> Gestures, and what I mean by that are small physical motions that convey feeling, ideally, or the passage of time, slightly less interesting, should be connected to your setting. If your setting is hackneyed, a smoke-filled bar, your gestures will likely be limited to those drags of cigarettes and long sips of whiskey. A restaurant will relegate you to lots of clinking cutlery. <laughs> um, someone, someone did a study of uh, the number of novels that have the phrase, somewhere a dog barked, um, <laughs> and it was... It's like 99% of published novels have that line or phrase in them. And I would say that 99% of scenes in restaurants or dinner tables have cutlery clinking. I've, I've done it, I'm completely guilty. Um, <clears throat> but I wanna give you some examples of what I think are, are good gestures and inventive ones. So let's look at what Ian McEwan does in Enduring Love when he introduces a character. She wore a long necklace of irregular chunks of amber in which her left hand was awkwardly entwined. Throughout my visit, she rolled and worried one piece, smaller than the rest, between her forefinger and thumb. Um, and this is beautiful because you get a description of character um, that's very visual. And a few years here, uh, a few years ago, I gave a talk on motion about again trying to bring um, static character descriptions in motion. This sort of does all of that at once. It gives something to break up the scene with that motion. The character is now um, moving on the page. <clears throat> It also speaks to her state of mind, which is what I was trying to convey, that you know, worrying um, a stone shows a certain nervousness. Um, here's a lovely move in Tom Rackman's The Imperfectionist, where an older man is in a bar in Rome with his wife. In his cupped hand, he planted a kiss and lobbed it at her like a grenade, tracing with his eyes the parabola up and over the table, down onto her cheek. Direct hit. <clears throat> we get character, we get emotion, we get playfulness. <clears throat> Here's Jennifer Egan. According to the muscles on Lou's face, he's grinding his teeth. Or later in another story, Stephanie took Bernie's hand and kissed a knuckle. Those are less inventive, but again, I, I just want to show what they serve the purpose in doing. Someone's grinding his teeth, somebody's kissing a hand. <clears throat> in both cases, these slight pauses in the dialogue allow for gestures that show us through action how the characters are feeling in the scene. And there should always be the question of how your character is feeling in the scene because something should be happening in the scene. The scene is born out of some kind of will or hope or objective. Which brings me to number four, intent and accident. Intent is generally what gives your scene at the very least momentum and in the best case suspense. Your character intends to accomplish something. It can be as simple as filling a vase with water as we'll see in a moment, as tense as resolving an argument, or as suspenseful as whether or not the character will survive. To show what I mean by intent, let's look briefly at the opening scene of, uh, the opening of a scene in The Sun Also Rises, in which Robert Cohn comes to see Jake Barnes in his office. This isn't in the handout. <clears throat> 
Hello, Robert, I said. Did you come in to cheer me up? Would you like to go to South America, Jake, he asked. No. Why not? I don't know. I never wanted to go. Too expensive. You can see all the South Americans you want in Paris anyway. They're not real South Americans. They look awfully real to me. I had a boat train to catch with a week's mail stories and only half of them written. Do you know any dirt, I asked. No. None of your exalted connections getting divorces? And so the scene proceeds, Robert Cohn asking not once but three times if Jake will go to South America. Jake, meanwhile, trying to get his work finished. Each man has a goal, and the scene takes shape around those contradictory elements, until Cohn finally hints <clears throat> at his real existential crisis and falls asleep after a drink while Jake is at the typewriter, still trying to finish his work. Cohn talks in his sleep, and it's finally revealed that he had a long fight with his wife the night before. Cohn falling asleep and talking in his sleep is what I like to think of as the accident in the scene, the element that neither character planned or intended. The accident can have major plot ramifications, as we'll see when we get to Ian McEwan's atonement, or it can merely help create a world that is alive, that feels unwritten, unscripted. I always seem to be citing the moment in Michael and Dodge's The English Patient when Catherine breaks off her affair with Count Almagy and then bangs her head on a tent pole as she says goodbye. This accident can be read as a metaphor for the war. She literally bangs into and hurts herself as she attempts to deal with her personal life or a foreshadowing of the violence that befalls her when she and Almagy separate. The action really interests me most, however, for its narrative strategy. This is a soft, light, gauzy moment in the novel, the lovers ending their affair. And that simple accident reminds us that they are not isolated contracts on the page enacting their own drama, but that, but that they live within a physical world. And at that moment, when we might be overwhelmed by her emotional pain, we're redirected to physical pain. The idea of accident, too, can be helpful when a scene feels stuck. Accident can be as simple as rain starting to fall, the lights going out, the car not starting, a coworker sitting down at the next table. It can help bring life to a scene that may start to feel overwhelmed by its intent. In terms of intent, it's important to remember that sometimes the intent is not made explicit, either to the readers or to the characters. And this brings me to what I consider another element of a really rich and moving scene, the unspoken. <clears throat> In the above scene from The Sun Also Rises, both characters were clear about what they wanted. Let's look at Hemingway's use, use of a different tactic. Hills Like White Elephants, which you have as a handout, is a great example of the unspoken. The story is, in fact, a single protracted scene. The hills across the valley of the Ebro were long and white. On this side, there was no shade and no trees, and the station was between two lines of rails in the sun. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and a curtain, made of strings of bamboo beads, hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. The American and the girl with him sat at a table in the shade outside the building. It was very hot, and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. What should we drink, the girl asked. She had taken off her hat and put it on the table. It's pretty hot, the man said. <clears throat> I just want to pause for a second. Um, this story is so artfully done and so much is accomplished in, um, in his use of the unspoken. Uh, for example, <clears throat> the gesture, she had taken off her hat and put it on the table, um, and the what should we drink, basically tells it that they've, they've just arrived, right? He doesn't have to say they just got there. The, um, the, the gesture that he's invoked gives us a sense of where we are in this, um, in this particular setting. Um, it's also important to note <clears throat> that she asks the first question, and it's a deferential question. What should we drink? <clears throat> it's pretty hot, the man said, which is, again, relates to the setting that's already been provided. And I've been reading a lot of Hemingway lately um, and have been really surprised. I, most of his work when I f first read it is so absolutely moving that it's very hard to pay attention to the craft, or I found it very hard to pay attention to the craft. You just get so swept up in the aliveness of it. Um, it's really interesting to go back and reread it with a little bit of emotional distance and to recognize his consistent use of color and temperature. Um, almost every scene is defined by a, a dominant color and a dominant temperature, um, and he will um, invoke that later on in the scene and it creates a sense of atmosphere but even here you see that it's it, it becomes part of the dialogue part of the conversation between the characters <clears throat> let's drink beer 
Dos cervezas, the man said into the curtain. Big ones, a woman asked from the doorway. Yes, two big ones. The woman brought two glasses of beer and two felt pads. She put the felt pads and the beer glasses on the table and looked at the man and the girl. The girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants, she said. I've never seen one, the man drank his beer. No, you wouldn't have. I might have, the man said. Just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. Um, so again, their dialogue is really revolving around what we've already, what he's already constructed as the setting, the heat and the hills. <clears throat> and it's interesting to note here, um, how many people have read this story before? Okay. Um, how many people, when they first read the story, knew what it was about or understood immediately what it was really about? Okay. Um, yeah, it's, um, the first time I read this story, I did not immediately realize what it was about. Um, and once, once you start to look at it closely, it becomes very clear. But I want to look at one of the first clues as to what's really going on here. <clears throat> she says, the hills look like white elephants. <clears throat> so there's already a sort of personification um, of the setting. And he's being argumentative, right? It's, it, the, you know, we're not told, there is no narration saying things were tense between this couple. We simply know that she's made a sort of passing comment about what she thinks she sees, and he, he sort of doesn't absorb that very well. The girl looked at the bead curtain. Again, one of the few props or, or um, pieces of the setting that Hemingway um, chose to include has now been invoked. We had dos cervezas, the man set into the curtain, and we now have um, the girl looking away at the bead curtain. So he's given us something in that space. And again, when you've got the white paper out and you're drawing and you need, you know, what, what's surrounding the space? There's a, you know, there's a doorway here. Is the door closed? Is it open? What's there? When you force yourself to imagine something like a bead curtain, you've, you have something um, that the character can look to when, you're, when, you're, when they disengage from the scene and the interaction momentarily. <clears throat> Anise del Toro, oh, I'm sorry, the girl looked at the bead curtain. They've painted something on it, she said. What does it say? Anise del Toro, it's a drink. Could we try it? The man called listen through the curtain. The woman came out from the bar. Four reales. We want two Anise del Toro. With water? Do you want it with water? I don't know, the girl said. Is it good with water? It's all right. You want them with water, asked the woman. Yes, with water. It tastes like licorice, the girl said, and put the glass down. That's the way with everything. Yes, said the girl, everything tastes of licorice, especially all the things you've waited so long for, like absinthe. Oh, cut it out. So again, by this point in the exchange, they've talked about the heat. Um, they've talked about what's written on the bead curtain. They've talked about what they should drink. And there's, there's a sense of irritation mounting between them. <clears throat> you started it, the girl said. I was being amused. I was having a fine time. Well, let's try and have a fine time. All right, I was trying. I said the mountains looked like white elephants. Wasn't that bright? That was bright. I wanted to try this new drink. That's all we do, isn't it? Look at things and try new drinks? I guess so. The girl looked across at the hills. They're lovely hills, she said. They don't really look like white elephants. I just meant the coloring of their skin through the trees. Should we have another drink? All right. So she sort of upped what she's looking at when she's, you know, the hills aren't just elephants now. She's thinking about their skin. It's become very, um, uh, they've been brought to life in a way that you, you don't quite understand as you're reading. <clears throat> and he ignores this comment. Um, should we have another drink? All right. The warm wind blew the bead curtain against the table. This is the fifth time the bead curtain has appeared. Um, and it, it, will, it will come again. Uh, <laughs> The beer's nice and cool, the man said. It's lovely, the girl said. It's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's not really an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground the table legs rested on. I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's not really anything. It's just to let the air in. So something has opened up suddenly in this conversation. The irritation is starting to reveal itself. There's an operation that's about to happen, and he clearly senses that this is why she's being slightly combative because she hasn't brought it up. He does. It's really an awfully simple operation. It's not really an operation at all. She does not answer him. This is a moment, again, a pause. This is where you need your gesture. You have to really think about the setting because she has to look at something. She has to do something. And this, again, she looks at the ground, looking at the ground, looking at your plate. That, that's perfectly valid. 
Um, I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. The girl did not say anything. This is her second silence. <clears throat> I'll go with you and I'll stay with you all the time. They just let the air in and then it's all perfectly natural. Then what will we do afterward? We'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. What makes you think so? That's the only thing that bothers us. It's the only thing that's made us unhappy. The girl looked at the bead curtain, put her hand out and took hold of two of the strings of beads. And you think then we'll be all right and be happy? I know we will. You don't have to be afraid. I've known lots of people that have done it. So have I, said the girl, and afterward they were all so happy. Well, the man said, if you don't want to, you don't have to. I wouldn't have you do it if you didn't want to, but I know it's perfectly simple. And you really want to. I think it's the best thing to do, but I don't want you to do it if you don't really want to. And if I do it, you'll be happy and things will be like they were and you'll love me. I love you now. You know I love you. I know. But if I do it, then it will be nice again, and if I say things are like white elephants, and you'll like it. I'll love it. I love it now, but I just can't think about it. You know how I get when I worry. If I do it, you won't ever worry. I won't worry about that because it's perfectly simple. <clears throat> then I'll do it because I don't care about me. I love that line. <laughs> um, we've all had these arguments with somebody where you get someone to concede to your point and they make it very clear that they're just doing it to please you. And it's not quite a concession then. It basically opens the argument up to another phase. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't care about me. Well, I care about you. Oh yes, but I don't care about me. And I'll do it and then everything will be fine. I don't want you to do it if you feel that way. The girl stood up and walked to the end of the station. Across on the other side were fields of grain and trees along the banks of the Ebro. Far away, beyond the river, were mountains. The shadow of a cloud moved across the field of grain, and she saw the river through the trees. And we could have all this, she said, and we could have everything, and every day we make it more impossible. What did you say? I said we could have everything. We can't have everything. No, we can't. We, can't, we can have the whole world. No, we can't. We can go everywhere. No, we can't. It isn't ours anymore. It's ours. No, it isn't. And once they take it away, you never get it back. Again, for, so for those of you encountering the story for the first time, is it becoming clear what this conversation is really about, what the operation in question is between the couple? Um, <clears throat> so she has conflated what the actual conversation with what is really going on in her head. Once they take it away, of course, it sounds like she's you know, she's saying once they take the world away, she's really talking about the baby. But they haven't taken it away. We'll wait and see. Come on back in the shade, he said. You mustn't feel that way. And again, a really small point, but come back in the shade. The just the very simple, clear setting of sun versus shade, bead curtain. This is all that it takes to sort of get get this scene going and, and, and keep these characters in motion together. <clears throat> I don't feel any way, the girl said. I just know things. I don't want you to do anything that you don't want to do, nor that isn't good for me, she said. I know. Could we have another beer? All right. But you've got to realize, I realize, the girl said. Can't we maybe stop talking? I just want to point out here the dialogue shift where the story starts with her staying down, you know, what should we drink? This absolute deferential attitude towards him. And now for the first time, she is cutting him off. Um, he can't get to the end of his sentences. <clears throat> so they're having a very sort of overt conversation, but just in the nature of the way the dialogue is working, it's, it's clear that other things are shifting between them. All right, but you've got to realize, I realize, can't we maybe stop talking? They sat down at the table and the girl looked across at the hills on the dry side of the valley, and the man looked at her and at the table. You've got to realize, he said, that I don't want you to do it if you don't want to. I'm perfectly willing to go through it if it means anything to you. Doesn't it mean anything to you? We could get along. This is a really, you know, rereading the story for the, you know, 10th, 20th time, that is such a tender moment um, that almost because of Hemingway's style where he doesn't narratively play the violins or sort of s throw the soft light on, this is really the moment where she's, she's trying to get him to say, like, don't, don't you want to, don't you want to keep the baby? Doesn't, am I the only person in this conversation who cares about this? And she does it in such a sort of quiet, quick way. Um, and he 
you know, the text doesn't quite recognize it and the, he doesn't quite recognize it. Of course it does, but I don't want anybody but you. I don't want anyone else. And I know it's perfectly simple. And he just, how many times has this guy said it's perfectly simple, right? I mean, you just, <laughs> um, she's, she's got no hope in this argument. Um, yes, you know it's perfectly simple. And so again, she's not agreeing that it's perfectly simple. She's now just saying, you know it's perfectly simple. <clears throat> It's all right for you to say that, but I do know it. <laughs> Would you do something for me now? I'd do anything for you. Would you please, 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 please stop talking? He did not say anything, but looked at the bags against the wall of the station. There were labels on them from all the hotels where they had spent nights. Um, that to me is also a truly great, simple line in the story that just does so much work. He has not given us narratively much context for how this how long this couple has been together. That simple line using those props right there with the stickers from all the places they spent nights tells us what sort of happened before this moment. <clears throat> but I don't want you to, he said. I don't care anything about it. I'll scream, the girl said. The woman came out through the curtains with two glasses of beer and put them down on the damp felt pads. The train comes in five minutes, she said. What did she say, asked the girl, that the train is coming in five minutes. The girl smiled brightly at the woman to thank her. I'd better take the bags over to the other side of the station, the man said. She smiled at him. All right, then come back and we'll finish the beer. He picked up the two heavy bags and carried them around the station to the other tracks. He looked up the tracks but could not see the train. Coming back, he walked through the bar room where people waiting for the train were drinking. He drank anise at the bar and looked at the people. They were all waiting reasonably for the train. He went out through the bead curtain. She was sitting at the table and smiled at him. Do you feel better, he asked. I feel fine, she said. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Oh, um, a really phenomenal story. And um, <clears throat> this story is an example of one of the first questions I asked about setting, are they in public or in private? Um, this same argument, should we have the abortion or not, could obviously could have been had in their hotel room. It might have been had in their hotel room um, the night before. The setting that Hemingway chooses for the story um, really tightly controls it in a way that um, forces the characters again, I think, to employ tactics that they wouldn't necessarily. And <clears throat> we have the woman coming and interrupting at this moment where she's threatened to scream and then somebody else intrudes on the scene, um, both as someone that sort of reigns in her emotion, but also basically to say the train is coming. Um, this brings me um, to the next element of the scene that I think it's important to think about, um, which is the issue of time. <clears throat> a scene begins, but how on earth do you end it? How long should it go on? So Hemingway here has given us at least two constraints on their conversation. They're at the bar, the waitress interrupts some of their emotional moments, and there's a train coming. We know that from the first paragraph. Um, and the train we realize, in the first paragraph, we don't know the meaning of the train arriving. It's just two people waiting for a train. We start to realize through the process of reading the story that this train, once they get on this train, that is their decision. It's been made. <clears throat> so the, in the final paragraph, it's only five minutes away. We realize their fate is sealed. The outcome of the scene is determined. Um, time has been pushing up against the scene in the form of a train arriving. Um, but a temporal pressure on a scene could be a husband returning home. It could be sunrise, sunset. Um, I am certainly guilty of writing these lines, and I, I'm sure I've read them other places. Um, you know, the sunlight began to seep through the curtains. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the dog barking. Um, but the point is, actually, there are situations in life in which the start of a new day can mean many, many things. Um, somebody's got to leave to go to work. Um, some kind of decision has to be made. It's It's... It's that outside pressure of the setting that's exerted on the scene that, again, makes it feel alive because it is, it is how our world operates. Um, a scene could um, also be brought to close by an accident. Um, the great library love scene in Atonement is brought to an abrupt end by the intrusion of a young girl. Um, I also want to make another comment about time and the scene. <clears throat> Within the scene, lines of dialogue bring the narrative into what we might think of as real time. It takes as long to read a line of dialogue as it would take to hear it in real life. 
And so in these moments, the space between reader and story synchronizes. The same is often true of a gesture, and most gestures that writers employ in their scenes are ones which maintain this reader-story synchronicity. Um, think of the gesture from Jennifer Egan, raising the hand and kissing the knuckle. Um, you know, I, I can say it and do it in the same amount of time. Um, this synchronicity is one reason why scenes feel lived in ways that other wonderful narration doesn't. I also think it's why, um, you know, the laziest readers and the, some of the laziest books sort of operate exclusively in that form where you're constantly in real time. I mean, it, it can be somewhat addictive so that when you feel like you're, you're distanced from the text and things are going on for years in the space of a paragraph, it, um, you're, again, more aware of the, of the fact that you're holding a book and you're not quite living in the moment. <clears throat> Okay, last but not least, a scene should have a narrative purpose within the larger whole. Sometimes a scene is the whole, as we saw with Hills Like White Elephants, where the entire story is built around the dramatic tension in one protracted scene. Um, within a novel, the question can be more complicated. It's tempting when you've got a lot of characters in action going to dramatize lots of things, to possibly dramatize everything. Um, but I would argue for something to truly be worthy of being a scene, we should really ask ourselves, can the novel exist without it? Um, does it change or determine the course of the story? Um, at this point, I'm going to start um, turning to this book. How many people have read Atonement? Okay, this is um, a marvelous book, and I'm going to read from a scene that I think is one of the best scenes I've ever read, um, and nothing wildly emotional or intense happens in it, but it's incredibly well executed, and it really employs every element that I've just been talking about. Um, so to give you a little background, <clears throat> um, we're at the sort of grand family estate of Cecilia. Cecilia is university aged and she has a sort of old and awkward friendship with Robbie who is close to her in age and he is the son of one of her family's servants. Um, where I'm going to start to read from, McEwen has just spent about two pages describing a porcelain vase um, that has been in Cecilia's family for years in which Cecilia simply wants to arrange flowers. Um, so let's see what McEwen does with this. <clears throat> Cecilia gripped the cool porcelain in both hands as she stood on one foot, and with the other hooked the French windows open wide. As she stepped out into the brightness, the rising scent of warm stone was like a friendly embrace. Two swallows were making passes over the fountain, and a shift-shaft song was piercing the air from within the sinewy gloom of the giant cedar of Lebanon. The flowers swung in the light breeze, tickling her face as she crossed the terrace and carefully negotiated the three crumbly steps down to the gravel path. Robbie turned suddenly at the sound of her approach. I was away in my thoughts, he began to explain. Would you roll me one of your Bolshevik cigarettes? So I just want to pause and look at this paragraph for a moment um, and point out everything that I think is um, phenomenal in this. Again, um, McEwen's use of... Um, Temperature, light, texture, motion, sound um, are all going on in this one paragraph. And what he does is, I think, which is really interesting, is he's constantly um, offering counterpoints. So um, you have the cool porcelain, and then you have the warmed stone. You have Cecilia stepping out into the brightness, and then you have the sinewy gloom of the giant cedar of Lebanon. Um, you have... Uh, her, the, the warm stone was like a friendly embrace, um, but she's negotiating steps that are crumbly. And, and for those of you who have read this whole novel, again, I think what, what for me makes McEwen such an amazing novelist and the experience of reading his novel so amazing is his um, ability to tap into life at all levels, beauty and love, war and destruction, um, integrity, uh, disloyalty, truth, lies. I mean, he, he encompasses sort of the whole range of the human experience in these sort of 350 pages so masterfully. And again, when I go back and look at the text closely, I'm, I'm aware of how much he does this on the micro level. It's not just the sort of larger story elements in which all this is being juggled. He's juggling it on the sentence level and the paragraph level. Um, I was away in my thoughts, he began to explain. Would you roll me one of your Bolshevist cigarettes? Um, another quick thing I just want to point out there, um, Hemingway does this a lot in his story. If you go back and look at the dialogue again, um, one of the easy mistakes to make, and certainly in the first draft process, is 
especially when you know what the intent of a scene is, people will have a conversation that is very straightforward. Would you roll me a cigarette? Yes, I will do that. You know, oh, you interrupted me. Oh, I'm so sorry I interrupted you. Um, what he's able to do, first of all, these characters are familiar with each other in the same way that the characters in Hills Like White Elephants are. And so both writers are able to, in the dialogue, um, have people ask questions that do not get directly answered. And this is, this is the way we are with our friends and loved ones. We all kind of have our own conversation running at times. Um, and, and that's one thing, certainly in the revision process, I think it's a really good way to sort of sharpen a scene is to go back and look and say, are people over explaining things? <clears throat> he threw his own cigarette aside, took the tin which lay on his jacket on the lawn and walked alongside her to the fountain. They were silent for a while. Beautiful day, she said through a sigh. He was looking at her with amused suspicion. There was something between them and even she had to acknowledge that a tame remark about the weather sounded perverse. This is the unspoken. <laughs> Now, this is a close third to Cecilia, we're in her sensibility going through the scene, but as, you know, for those of you who read the novel, or certainly as we get to the end of the scene, um, you will see that sexual tension is what really dominates this scene, and all that's been said was beautiful day. <laughs> but through his use of the unspoken, he's able to give, you know, what is really sort of banal conversation a charge. <clears throat> How's Clarissa? He was looking down at his fingers, rolling the tobacco. Again, a gesture we've got, you know, she asked for a cigarette, he's, he's rolling one. Boring, we mustn't say so. I wish she'd get on with it. She does and it gets better. They slowed, then stopped so that he could put the finishing touches to her roll up. She said, I'd rather read Fielding any day. She felt she had said something stupid. Robbie was looking away across the park and the cows toward the oak wood that lined the river valley. The wood she had run through that morning. He might be thinking she was talking to him in code, suggestively conveying her taste for the full-blooded and sensual. That was a mistake, of course, and she was discomfited and had no idea how to put him right. She liked his eyes, she thought, the unblended mix of orange and green, made even more granular in the sunlight. And she liked the fact that he was so tall. It was an interesting combination in a man, intelligence and sheer bulk. Cecilia had taken the cigarette and he was lighting it for her. This also is a wonderful scene. On the one hand, she's thinking, I really hope he doesn't get the wrong idea, uh, you know, that I, that I, you know, have a taste for passion. <laughs> and she's completely checking him out and, you know, mm -hmm. remarking how she likes the bulk of him. Um, and again, this is the use of the unspoken. Um, if, if you stripped this scene of the unspoken of Cecilia's interiority, it is a nothing scene. There's really n nothing going on in this. Um, I know what you mean, he said as they walked the remaining few yards to the fountain. There's more life in Fielding, but he can be psychologically crude compared to Richardson. She set down the vase by the uneven steps that rose to the fountain's basin. The last thing she wanted was an undergraduate debate on 18th century literature. She didn't think Fielding was crude at all, or that Richardson was a fine psycho psychologist, but she wasn't going to be drawn in, defending, defining, attacking. She was tired of that, and Robbie was tenacious in argument. Instead, she said, Leon's coming today. Did you know? I heard a rumor. That's marvelous. He's bringing a friend, this man Paul Marshall, the chocolate millionaire. Oh, no, and you're giving him flowers. She smiled. Was he pretending to be jealous to conceal the fact that he was? She no, I love that. <laughs> she no longer understood him. They had fallen out of touch at Cambridge. It had been too difficult to do anything else. She changed the subject. The old man says you're going to be a doctor. I'm thinking about it. You must love the student life. He looked away again, but this time only for a second or less. And when he turned to her, she thought she saw a touch of irritation. Had she sounded condescending? She saw his eyes again, green and orange flecks, like a boy's marble. When he spoke, he was perfectly pleasant. I know you never like that sort of thing, see, but how else do you become a doctor? That's my point, another six years, why do it? He wasn't offended. She was the one who was over-interpreting and jittery in his presence, and she was annoyed with herself. He was taking her question seriously. No one's really going to give me work as a landscape gardener. I don't want to teach or go in for the civil service, and medicine interests me. He broke off as a thought occurred to him. Look, I've agreed to pay your father back. That's the arrangement. Um, so we not only get her unspoken, but we realize there's a sort of interior narrative going on with him, this sort of awkwardness about his role in relation to her family. He's the servant's um, son, and clearly there's a money issue. <clears throat> I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. <clears throat> we are now fully at the fountain. Awkwardly, for she still had her cigarette, she picked up the vase and balanced it on the rim of the basin. It would have made better sense to take the flowers out first, but she was too irritable. Her hands were hot and dry, and she had to grip the porcelain all the tighter. 
Robbie was silent, but she could tell from his expression, a forced stretch smile that did not part his lips, that he regretted what he had said. That was no comfort either. This was what happened when they talked these days. One or the other was always in the wrong, trying to call back the last remark. There was no ease, no stability in the course of their conversations, no chance to relax. Instead, it was spikes, traps, and awkward turns that caused her to dislike herself almost as much as she disliked him. Though she did not doubt that he was mostly to blame. She hadn't changed, but there was no question that he had. He was putting distance between himself and the family that had been completely open to him and given him everything. For this reason alone, expectation of his refusal and her own displeasure in advance, she had not invited him to dinner that night. If he won in distance, then let him have it. One of the four dolphins whose tail supported the shell on which the triton squatted, the one nearest to Cecilia had its wide open mouth stopped with moss and algae. Its spherical stone eyeballs, as big as apples, were iridescent green. The whole statue had acquired around its northerly surfaces a bluish-green patina, so that from certain approaches, and in low light, the muscle-bound triton really seemed a hundred leagues under the sea. <clears throat> Her idea was to lean over the parapet and hold the flowers in the vase while she lowered it on its side into the water. But it was at this point that Robbie, wanting to make amends, tried to be helpful. That is his intent. <clears throat> Let me take that, he said, stretching out a hand. I'll fill it for you and take you the flowers. And you take the flowers. I can manage, thanks. She was already holding the vase over the basin. But he said, look, I've got it. And he had, tightly between forefinger and thumb. Your cigarette will get wet. Take the flowers. This was a command on which he tried to confer urgent masculine authority. The effect on Cecilia was to cause her to tighten her grip. She had no time and certainly no inclination to explain that plunging vase and flowers into the water would help her with the natural look she wanted in the arrangement. She tightened her hold and twisted her body away from him. He was not so easily shaken off. With a sound like a dry twig snapping, a section of the lip of the vase came away in his hand and split into two triangular pieces which dropped into the water and tumbled to the bottom in a synchronous seesawing motion and lay there several inches apart, writhing in the broken light. Um, so, so many things going on this scene. We have this sort of physical tussle between these two characters again where there's obviously a sort of unspoken sexual tension. We know that money's an issue, and he has just broken the family heirloom. Um, Cecilia and Robbie froze in the attitude of their struggle. Their eyes met, and what she saw in the bilious melange of green and orange was not shock or guilt, but a form of challenge or even triumph. She had the presence of mind to set the ruined vase back down on the step before letting herself confront the significance of the accident. So this brings me back to that Ellen, to the scene again. Her intent is just to fill the vase with water, his intent is to be helpful, and an accident ensues. <clears throat> um, I'll try to just speed through the rest of this. It was irresistible, she knew, even delicious, for the graver it was, the worse it would be for Robbie, her dead uncle, her, her father's dear brother, the wasteful war, the treacherous crossing of the river, the preciousness beyond money, the heroism and goodness, all the years backed up behind the history of the vase, reaching back to the genius of Herbolt and beyond him to the mastery of the arcanist who had reinvented porcelain. You idiot, look what you've done. He looked into the water, then he looked back at her and simply shook his head as he raised a hand to cover his mouth. By this gesture, he assumed full responsibility, but at that moment, she hated him for the inadequacy of the response. He glanced toward the basin and sighed. For a moment, he thought she was about to step backward onto the vase and he raised his hand and pointed, though, she, though he said nothing. Instead, he began to unbutton his shirt. Immediately, she knew what he was about. Intolerable. He had come to the house and removed his shoes and socks. Well, she would show him then. She kicked off her sandals, unbuttoned her blouse, and removed it, unfastened her skirt, and stepped out of it and went to the basin wall. He stood with hands on his hips and stared as she climbed into the water in her underwear. Denying his help, any possibility of making amends was his punishment. The unexpectedly freezing water that caused her to gasp was <clears throat> was his punishment. She held her breath and sank, leaving her hair fanned out across the surface. Drowning herself would be his punishment. When she emerged a few seconds later with a piece of pottery in each hand, he knew better than to offer to help her out of the water. The frail white nymph from whom water cascaded far more successfully than it did from the beefy triton carefully placed the pieces by the vase. She dressed quickly, turning her wet arms with difficulty through her silk sleeves and tucking the unfastened blouse into her skirt. She picked up her sandals and thrust them under her arm, put the fragments in the pocket of her skirt and took up the vase. Her movements were savage and she would not meet his eye. He did not exist, he was banished, and this was also the punishment. He stood there dumbly as she walked away from him, 
barefoot across the lawn, and he watched her darkened hair swing heavily across her shoulders, drenching her blouse. Then he turned and looked into the water in case there was a piece she had missed. It was difficult to see because of the roiling surface had yet to recover its tranquility, and the turbulence was driven by the lingering spirit of her fury. He put his hand flat upon the surface as though to quell it. She, meanwhile, had disappeared into the house. Um, an incredibly vivid scene, and there are sort of, the, the prop is the vase and the setting is the fountain, and they're both absolutely integral to the scene. The vase breaks in the fountain, she goes in after it, um, and in terms of the larger story, the, the last point that I was making that the story absolutely has, to, the scene has to serve a narrative purpose, there are two things that come from this scene happening. One is that Robbie is staring at the sort of his drenched childhood love <laughs> and suddenly re, you know, rethinking his attitude towards her. And this will, um, in the next few chapters, prompt him to write a very um, uh, tawdry note to her. This scene is also, because the setting, it is um, near, um, it is the back of the sort of family estate, it's, it's witnessed by someone else in the house. Um, and this is really sort of what propels the whole novel forward and nothing really that remarkable has happened but a piece of porcelain was broken. Um, but I, I hope from, from looking at that, um, you know, th that you saw the ways in which the elements that I was trying to talk about were, were all employed and, and for me that's what makes the scene so wonderful. Um, I, will, uh, I will stop there.